everybody. Thank you for joining. My name is Lena Thomas, and I'm the Program and Engagement Manager at C2ST. Welcome to today's program. This program is presented to you by the Chicago Council on Science and Technology and the Chicago Public Library in partnership with WindyCon and the UIC Latino Cultural Center. For those of you that are new to the Chicago Council on Science and Technology, C2ST is a 13-year-old not-for-profit organization that seeks to enhance the public's understanding and appreciation of science and technology and their impact on society. C2ST hosts about 30 free or low-cost programs throughout the year on any and all science and technology topics. Now, before we begin today's program, I want to remind everyone to visit c2st.org so you can learn about our programming and get information about our upcoming virtual events. And remember to sign up for our mailing list so that you can get reminders about these programs as well. Please type in c2st c2st.cnf.io into your web browser and click today's session to ask questions throughout the talk and evaluate the program at the end. Again, that's c2st.cnf.io. Feel free to also post comments uh, or questions using the comment section below. Um, all those questions will be forwarded to us. Now, I'd like to begin by introducing today's speakers. Dr. Marcella Carena is a distinguished scientist and the head of the theoretical physics department at the Fermi National Accelerator Laboratory. She has also been a professor of physics at the University of Chicago since 2008. Her research explores the possible connections between Higgs, Higgs physics, supersymmetry, unification, and dark matter. We also have Michael Zapata who's joining us and he's the founding editor of Make Literary Magazine and the author of the critically acclaimed novel, The Lost Book of Andana Moreau. As an educator, he's also taught literature and writing in, in high school servicing dropout students. Now, I'd like to turn it over to Michael to start us off. First off, I want to thank everybody um, involved in setting this up, and I want to give it a special thanks to Marcella for joining us. It's been a dream of mine since the novel was released to be able to have time and, and to talk to a theoretical physicist. So what I'll do is I'll briefly give all of our viewers a uh, sort of brief summary uh, of my novel and a little bit talk a little bit about the absolute fascination I've had as a novelist with the day-to-day -day lives of physicists, scientists in general, but particularly for this novel, physicists. So The Lost Book of Adana Moreau centers essentially around exile. And it centers around a young Dominican woman who's exiled in 1916 to New Orleans. And she writes a cult classic science fiction novel about parallel universes. And as we know, the concept of parallel universes um, is, is a very heavy, big, fundamental science fiction um, exploration in the 20th century. Um, before she passes away, she writes a sequel. And it's in that sequel where some of the science and where some of the concept of parallel universes get expanded. Um, the novel itself follows the mystery of how in 2004, a young concierge in Chicago discovers the manuscript, even though it was purportedly destroyed. Um, and it also follows the life of her son, who becomes a ousted and then a very sort of acclaimed theoretical physicist who specializes in parallel universes. This is where the science and the sci-fi <laughs> um, interact conceptually, but I was really excited. Um, I'm really excited today to be able to speak with Marcella. Um, a lot of my novel focuses not only on the lost history of science fiction, but also what we can see is a lost history of physicists, a lost history of those physicists of color, um, those physicists and scientists who are women, who have not been in equal parts recorded in our history in the same way that science fiction writers of color and women have not been. So I absolutely became fascinated with the lives of physicists. Um, read a countless number of interviews with them. I tried to delve into the theory. <laughs> I was joking with Marcella that I have a layman's understanding, but an absolute fascination with it. And so I'm really excited about this. So I do want to start off by asking, um, asking you, Marcella, can you talk a little bit, can you talk a little bit about the series of events or the moments in your life in which you knew physics was the path that you wanted to follow? Uh, thank you, Michael. Uh, it's a pleasure for me to be here to, this afternoon with you. Uh, I have first to say that I, I enjoyed so much reading the book. <laughs> uh, it was a real pleasure and um, in different places of the book, I, I felt Those myself very identified who are with women. Uh, the characters, uh, with their lives, with their challenges, 
you know, different, but uh, in, in parallel. <laughs> and uh, so I would, I would recommend to anyone to read the book. And this is not something Michael asked me to do. It's because I really feel, uh, I was very excited. I enjoyed it a lot. So uh, now moving a bit, uh, of course, you know, one of the things I enjoyed a lot is because the main character is a theoretical physicist. Uh, is actually a theoretical particle physicist, particle slash cosmologist. Um, I'm a particle physicist. My husband is a particle physicist, and my son is starting to become a theoretical cosmologist. So, uh, so in many ways, the book was very close to my heart. So I, I think that um, you know I, I have a bit of an unconventional path as to how I became a physicist. Uh, I'm originally from Argentina. Uh, my parents were uh, the immigrant children of uh, Italians and Spaniards. So my mom from Spain, my father from Italy. Um, so, you know, I grew in a middle class, maybe middle high class, a bit where somewhere there where uh, my mom really wanted me to become a very well-educated young lady. So she taught me, or she sent me to learn uh, music and painting and, and Ballet. Ballet was my preferred second direction if I would have not become a physicist, I guess. Um, but life went in another direction. So, but I would say that, um, you know, this, not really that I uh, at that moment realized, but looking backwards, I realized that the first time I was um, thinking about physics unconsciously, I guess, was um, so in the, in the, in the during the year, I would study and live in the big city, in the big apple of Argentina, Buenos Aires. Uh, but in the summer, we would go to the little ranch in the outskirts of uh, Buenos Aires. And there, uh, you know, in the nights with my, my friends and my cousins, we will just uh, look at, at the grandness of the universe uh, in very deep darkness of the night. And, uh, and we were watching the stars. And of course, at that time, we knew very little about the physics related to it. Uh, we did not know that those lights were coming from the past, uh, but it was breathtaking. And so I think that was the first time and I was like five or six or seven years old at that time, I guess, uh, what looking at the Via Lactea in the Argentinian Pampas. So I think that was my first touch in my heart of, of physics. This absolutely confirms my suspicions that physicists at heart are poets, and that there's this this question of un revealing the unknown or the invisible or the unseen, um, or as so you elegantly told me before, all those things that are almost not talking to us, which I just found just a beautiful phrase in the sense of looking for the structure of the universe. Um, can, you, can you talk to us a little bit about, you know, the idea of being a physicist and the idea of coming home with your work, right? I mean, you, you have this emergence as, as a young child, um, seeing those stars and obviously growing up in, in a challenging political climate in Argentina, and mm -hmm. then finding yourself moving from the arts to physicists, um, to being a physicist and interest in science. Can you, can you, and you even mentioned that it's hard to decouple your work, right? When you're mm -hmm. home. And this feels very familiar as a writer. You know, the problems in your mind that you're consistently trying to solve. Can, can you talk a little bit about navigating that um, as a physicist today in your work and also sort of what that means, um, what that means being in the United States and what that means being um, a physicist and a predominantly white male um, fields, how does this sort of like intertwine? And, and you said your life and your work never is decoupled. I, I found that fascinating. Yeah, uh, I think that, um, yeah, this, this issue that, you know, kind of uh, being a physicist, being a researcher in general, I would say, not only a physicist, but for me, physics is what is my experience. I think is uh, a way of life, a style of life, okay? So I, I think, uh, you know, you start thinking about a problem that interests you. Um, you know, scientists in general are trained to be problem solvers of mm -hmm. things that are, in, you know, 
puzzling, uh, full of intrigue. Okay, yeah. it's like uh, it's like trying to you know uh, uh, write a creamy or read a creamy and try to understand what's going on. But uh, here, you know, the the, um, the suspects are the part. In my case, are the particles, and uh, and the way to try to find the answers are mostly through uh, physical laws and equations. But of course. Uh, what we are asking is, you know, how, first of all, I think that um, my, my path into becoming a physicist was um, not linear at all. I mean, before I, I started studying engineering, so I, because I was good at math, and so mm. sounded like a good idea. Um, I, I soon discovered that my civil engineering uh, abilities were not so good. <laughs> so it was not in my heart. Um, then I, I, because I'm a very stubborn person, I, um, I kept in my uh, second year of engineering and I started uh, studying philosophy, um, which I was fascinated with, you know, starting to learn about philosophical thinking, which is in some way the questions philosophy asks are not so far away from the questions that physics asks. Absolutely. It's just that we have different tools to, you know, logic is in both, okay? But um, what fascinated to me, uh, was fascinating to me from physics is that on top of the logic that you have in philosophy, uh, in physics you have all you know the, the strong or strength of the mathematical tools that are really um, uh, you know the, the best you can have in order to pose questions that you want clear answers about. Because you know. uh, so I I I start you know I physics uh, got me from Argentina to Germany, to Switzerland, and to the United States. So that was a wow. journey in that way as well. I mean, as I said, my, my grandparents were immigrants. Um, I am an immigrant today here in the US as well. Um, and of course, that there are two sides of the story. One is to become a theoretical physicist has its challenges for everybody. Uh, it's a challenging profession. It's quite competitive, actually, and people are very dedicated in that sense is that this is, as I say, is a, a, a style of life because it's of course not something that you start at a, a 9 a.m. And, and finish at five. It's something that is with you uh, mm -hmm. everywhere, you know, while you cook, in the shower, uh, while you take care of your kids, all the time, all the time. Absolutely. <laughs> and and probably, I, I, I so, in, oh, go ahead. No, no, I mean, so probably writing is very similar. But right? you, you very don't... similar, yeah. You're, it's creative problems and you feel like you're living in, in two worlds at once when you're trying to solve the issues at hand, whether it's language or philosophy. It's so interesting to me that you had started uh, with philosophy because I'd like to reserve just a little time to get into the science. I know so many of our viewers um, are interested in how these worlds over, you know, relate. So just to give a little bit of feedback, in, in my novel, um, Donna Moreau, she writes this called classic science fiction novel, and her son emerges from the Great Depression and World War II to become a theoretical physicist specializing in parallel universes. So when I'm thinking about this through language, and I'm thinking about one of the core questions for me as a, as a writer is what if? And it's a core philosophical question. It, humans have this unbounded idea ability to think about what ifs, right? Whether we can disprove parallel universes or not, the human mind almost seems apt to like inhabit them. So it also serves, I really like, you know, when you had mentioned being an immigrant, I'm first generation, my father is from Ecuador. And for me, the metaphor of parallel universes is being a central one in which people who are immigrants and exiles experience their lives. You're inhabiting and learning a new world. And so through many of my characters, whether they're dealing with that metaphor or whether they're dealing with the absolute horror and beauty of the potentiality of parallel universes. That question again of what if, what if historical conditions were different? What if my life had been different when I make these different choices? And in the process of trying to think about that, I was researching a little bit the inflationary models, bubble universes, quantum effects causing, you know, the this theory of quantum effects causing um, the universe to constantly split into every possible timeline. I know like Hugh Everett the third, who proposed this was initiated as a madman, much <laughs> like Maxwell, the character in my novel. Um, but I also think there's a philosophical core to that. Can thinking about an alternate timeline 
alter our decision making today. Um, so I, I have a very big question <laughs> for you, Marcella, as a theoretical uh, as a physicist is, what are your thoughts um, on parallel universes? And also, what's even more thought provoking is can you describe a little bit about your work in answering that? I always like to think of it as an ancient question. Why does matter? And so why do we exist? <laughs> Um, yeah, so I, your work is fascinating in that, and I'd love to, for you to be able to talk about that. So they, these are, uh, from the physicist's point of view, there are uh, many things converging. So in the things that you are uh, discussing, of course, we, we kind of believe there was uh, some, like uh, almost 14 billion years ago, a big bang, correct? And, and uh, at least our universe was created, and what this multiverse postulate uh, one of the options of the multiverse is that maybe there were many universes that were created at similar times, almost together. And because the, um, uh, we are living in a, in a background of multiverses, in a, uh, we are living in a, uni in a, in a basically uh, these multiverses that are uh, expanding. So originally, as we know, there was a, an exponential uh, acceleration, expansion, that was what we call inflation. Then the universe uh, for quite a while uh, slowed down uh, its expansion, kept expanding, but at a lower rate. And then we know that um, about 4 billion years ago, we, um, we understand today that uh, the universe start to uh, have an accelerated expansion again. So the point is that what we are talking about is this primordial inflation, you know, uh, instance of the Big Bang. And the idea is one can think, and there are many people thinking this way, and I have to say I'm not an expert on that, so I will then branch into what I do. Um, you know, I know of it, but I have not worked myself on it. Uh, so there are many ideas of this uh, inflation. There are, of course, um, my lab is uh, one of the leading labs, Fermi National Lab, who is now engaged in um, an experiment that has different stages. Now is what is called CNB stage three, and we are going, that's what's going on. And then we are going to an S4. Um, these are telescopes that are um, in the South Pole and, and actually in, in Chile, in, in the Andes. Uh, and the idea is to prove uh, this concept of inflation, uh, this, this original inflation or cosmological inflation. And, and what type of inflation was it? Was it this mm -hmm. eternal inflation that generated these multiverses? It's very hard for us to know because uh, it's very hard to prove, almost maybe impossible, maybe not. I mean, nothing is impossible. One thing I love about your book that at some point um, when, when Maxwell uh, Moreau, the, the, the character is young and goes to a lecture uh, in the UK, and him and other younger uh, students uh, are fascinated by this idea of someone trying to think about, you know, questioning uh, what the uh, usual scientist or what the, the common law among scientists at that moment uh, was. And it's very important because I think that's what makes science, science, that we are asking questions that no one else dared to ask before. Absolutely. And so that's super important. And, and, and we have to be humble because, again, so going back to the inflation, we don't really know uh, what type of inflation happened. And we are, we are now today devising experiments to try to understand if there was something that fits more, something like an eternal inflation that we don't know about because, because of the expansion, our universe got disconnected to all the other universes that were uh, created at that moment, and we are in our universe now, and this is what we know, correct? But there could be other parallel universes that we don't know of. But important is not if they are parallel universes or not. Of course, it's not that I wouldn't like to know, but, but most important is to have the attitude of questioning, as you say, the what if, to questioning um, what are the possibilities? I need to understand. I'm, I'm posing very difficult questions, and that's where I will do a small transition and, and then uh, do a pause. Is that um, it is possible that we have this universe and there are parallel universes that are somehow different, but not so different. And maybe at some point there is an experiment that allows us to 
uh, have a portal into those other universes. What has to do with my work today? Uh, I'm very interested in thinking about uh, what is what we call dark matter. So what we do know, because of its gravitational interactions, is that 85% of all the matter in the universe is not luminous, but is dark. And when we say dark, it means it's not really talking to us in mm -hmm. the usual way. So we don't have an easy way to understand how it behaves. And at the moment, we don't have a clue what it is. <laughs> Really. Uh, we don't have a clue, and we don't have a clue in 80 orders of magnitude. We don't know wow. really where it could be. Uh, we are trying um, many out-of-the-box new experiments, and we are pursuing experiments that we have been doing for more than 20 years. Um, the huge machine, the huge accelerator at Geneva, Switzerland, the Large Hadron Collider, is also trying to create dark matter. I yeah, see. Wow. Uh, uh, and all this is... Uh, a huge question. So up to now, uh, particle physics has done a huge, um, uh, um, uh, and we have a, a very impressive understanding of all the particles, all the matter that we know, okay? All what it makes, you know, the spoon with, with which we eat the cereal every day, or what it makes the stars in the sky. Mm -hmm. uh, we know that. But we don't know what it is dark matter. And we know that dark matter is really what holds the universe together, the and gravitational force. Absolutely. And this is what's so fascinating to me because that phrase, almost not talking to us. There's a writer, Roberto Bolaño, he's a Chilean writer. And he made uh -huh. his fame as a young Mexican uh, writer, you know, when he moved to Mexico. And there's a phrase of his in his masterpiece, 2666, which aligns scientists and artists together in that we're feeling our way through the dark. <laughs> <laughs> I couldn't think of a better phrase considering your work in dark matter. Um, and I, I just enjoy that concept so thoroughly because it, it, novelists and artists and physicists, at the core, we're asking similar questions. And mm -hmm. the burden of proof is on the scientist, of course, which is why I have so much admiration. Um, thank you. Thank you so much um, for that description. It, it, it's just so uh, helpful for me to think through what questions you ask every day as, as a physicist. Yeah, I, 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 in connection to this idea of, uh, you know, universe portal to other universes. So I am really working in this universe, <laughs> um, at least now. <laughs> um, and, uh, but uh, many of the, uh, as I said, we don't have a clue what is this dark matter. Uh, and uh, dark is because it's obscure, its nature is so obscure to us, we don't understand it, correct? And so the idea that many of us, including me, has been working on lately is that, you know, we have in this universe, we have uh, what we call our sector, let me put it that way, we can call it our world, but I, we call it sector, uh, and there is a dark sector where dark matter resides, and maybe other parallel particles of the ones that we know. And in your book, you talk about this paramanu that I really love uh, as a fundamental particle. Uh, in physics today, we, we have what we call the standard model of particle physics. Uh, and there are many uh, paramanu particles there, fundamental particles there. And uh, we don't know if that matter is a fundamental particle. And the idea is that maybe there is our sector in this universe, but it's still our sector, and a dark sector that uh, we don't know much anything about. And the idea is that somehow there is a portal between two, these two sectors, and there are um, you know, some messengers that basically can tell us uh, the secrets of the dark sector. Wow. And so that's why I'm working on, uh, well, at least a big part of what I'm working on. And, uh, one of these portals, uh, we think, can be the last particle that we have uh, discovered uh, almost 80 years ago, 4th of July of 2012. Uh, that was announced, the discovery of what is called the, the Higgs boson, or the God particle is called. Mm -hmm. It's called the God particle because the idea is that it what makes all the particles we, we know um, slow down from the speed of light and acquire some mass and make the universe the way we know it possible. I love it. So that, and it, it, it's what language does for our thoughts. 
<laughs> I, I love so, it. so this Higgs particle was the major discovery. The, the Large Hadron Collider was mainly built to discover this particle. And so, so this happened, you know, and, and uh, going a bit on the personal side, I remember being in this same house and now, <laughs> but in another room, uh, with about uh, 25 of my friends, not all physicists, some are physicians or whatever. <laughs> and uh, mm -hmm. so friends and my, my kids, my two boys, and watching at 2 a.m. in the morning, because it was in Geneva, Switzerland, 9 a.m., wow. um, my, my close friend, uh, who is the, the um, director general of the CERN laboratory, uh, Fabiola Gianotti, and she was one of the uh, spoke women in that case, spoke persons of the two big experiments. And she was showing us that they have finally found the God particle of the Higgs boson. So extraordinary. And to have that moment with family and friends makes it so, that's, these are the stories I live for. To have that sort of yeah. intimacy when you have this global discovery, it's extraordinary. Yeah, we were so lucky. I think we were very blessed to be living that experience. You know, yeah. we have that opportunity to be sitting there. Uh, I work on this Higgs particle for like uh, 25 years of my life. <laughs> so to, you know, of course, uh, the person who thought about that first was Mr. Higgs. Uh, and he thought about it in 1964. And it took uh, basically, you know, half a century to wow. have the technology and to be able to build an amazing machine that could actually recreate uh, the basically one tenth of a billionth of a second after the Big Bang, wow. the energies and the conditions of that in order to be able to produce this particle. And that conditions and, of just asking the what if. It, it, exactly. Yeah, exactly. whenever I read about Higgs and, and how far sighted his work was, and can, and I don't want to say conceptually, but I want to say, obviously, theoretically, just that what if is beautiful. I, I know that, I know that we, we needed to have time. I feel like I could talk to you <laughs> all night about this, <laughs> and we will, we will, whether it's on, on camera or not. Um, but I know that um, we wanted to save some space for some questions from our audience. Um, so I wanted to pass it on um, to Lena, right, um, to, to see if there's any audience members that have questions for myself or Marcella. And before we do that, Marcella, I just want to say thank you so much. It's always it's been such a joy to talk to you these few days. Thank you. I just want to remind everyone to go to c2st.cnf.io to send in your questions. If it's easier for you to do that in the Facebook comments or YouTube comments, feel free to post your questions there, and one of our moderators will send the question over to us. Um, so to start us off, one of our first questions. Uh, is actually for you, Michael. What was the research process like for writing your book and where did you struggle the most? Oh, that's such a good question. Thank you. You know, I, the book itself, because it delves into not only science and the history of science fiction, but also history, it takes place in various eras, the Russian Revolution, it takes place during the Great Depression. I found for myself that I was getting lost in the labyrinth of the historical record. And it wasn't until I discovered the oral tradition until I discovered, um, you know, I'm, I'm a Chicagoan, so the first person who always comes to mind is Studs Terkel, who um, spent so much time interviewing people in Chicago and recording those conversations and allowing people to paint a portrait of themselves. And it wasn't until as a writer where I started really digging into diaries and the oral tradition in which um, the history itself started to make sense for me. For the physics in this, there be, was an enormous amount of doubt. As there always is, my I do have a uh, I do have a, a bit of a science background in evolutionary biology, a, d a different field. I, right now, I'm researching for a novel, which is about an ecologist, and it feels like familiar territory. But studying theoretical physicists, I, I was all, I've always been enamored with physicists as the smartest humans in the room, and so it was such a challenge. And I wanted to to live up a little bit to that challenge in the book. But again, for me, what, what helped me through the science was those questions that we started off this afternoon with when I asked Marcella, what was a moment in which you first started to think about physics? And it tends to be a moment that novelists and poets can grapple with, right? How does, how does a mind suddenly turn towards science? And, and, and so I think it wasn't until I started asking myself that question about the lives of scientists, especially when they're young, um, that I was able to allow myself to write them as people and not be so heavily focused on the science that is proved or disproved. 
Thank you. And then Marcella, I think this will be a nice tie in. Uh, do you find it fun to read uh, science fiction that touches on physics or is it frustrating when the science isn't perfect? Oh no, <laughs> Sci science is never perfect. <laughs> uh, in fact, you know, when, when uh, one of the first things that you learn by doing research is that um, 90% of your ideas probably will not work, <laughs> correct? So, um, no, reading science fiction is exciting for me because, you know, I can connect with it. And of course, the boundaries are different, correct? Because you are, you can allow yourself uh, much more freedom, okay? But um, it is a very uh, invisible uh, thread that connects the way of thinking uh, when you are trying to think about science fiction and where you are trying to think about um, new ideas in uh, scientific research. And then to follow up on that, what aspects of your work did you see within Mike's book? Well, uh, one is, is the one I was saying, the connection of um, something we know and uh, we understand well. In his case was you know, we, we are looking at our universe that, well, we don't know super well, but it's here. We, we are quite certain that it's here. And then there are these unknown parallel universes that we don't know if they are there. Uh, we don't know if we have, will ever be able to prove that they are there. In what I'm doing, there are two things that touch upon that. One, uh, there are two things I'm excited about these days is one is to understand uh, what is the, the essence of dark matter. And so, as I said, we are thinking about um, our, our world and this dark world, if you want to call it that way, um, which has a lot of similarities. You know, we have some forces we understand, we have particles we understand. The idea is that in this, in this dark world or dark sector, there are um, other forces and other particles that have some connection with ours, the same as you think in parallel universe, but we don't really know exactly. And so we only have to find a portal to be able to poke what is going on in that dark sector. So that's one similarity. Uh, the other one is when you think about, um, and I think we discussed this with Michael before, um, one of the most exciting questions you can ask is, why, why are we here? Why do we exist? And uh, which is uh, in the physics point of view is to explain why there is more matter rather than antimatter or why there is matter rather than nothing, rather than radiation. Uh, and there again, um, sometimes the theories are entangled because when you do a theory it has to solve all the problems, correct, in physics or have to, you know, uh, not all, but has at least not to violate any laws of physics or any known experiment, experimental data. So, so again, trying to solve that question, there are different situations. Uh, one that is dear to my heart that is related to the Higgs boson uh, and the others that are uh, more hard to prove by um, experimental evidence. So in that way, I was reading her book and I was thinking, uh, you know, uh, Maxwell Moreau uh, was very well aware that, you know, his theories were acclaim and, uh, and, and, and undervalue or, or misjudge depending on the circle. And so that happens all the time in science. And so I think that was something that I could connect very much. So with, with what he was trying to say. That's wonderful. Um, and we have now more of an abstract question and I'm gonna um, ask both of you to chime in. Um, is it possible to have a universe where things we consider are things we consider to be supernatural, things such as gods, ghosts, and miracles, could actually exist? Would the laws of physics in any potential universe prohibit such things? Oh, this is what I call the Doctor Who question <laughs> <laughs> of science. You know, I um, just to briefly add to what Marcella was saying. So much, I think, in the process of thinking about art, and so much of the process of um, novel writing um and particularly because half of the novel too there's there's a his there's a, his, a historian in there and I'm, I'm a big fan of the french existentialists who are often saying well what the hell are we supposed to do now that we do exist right so i was like i always thought of it like as these two two symmetrical 
um, experiences. And that does lead into this question, and this is something I'm gonna defer to Marcella, because in the world of fiction, those things do exist and it's your job to make them believable on, on the page, on, on the what if. Um, in, the, in, the, in the small amount of research that I've looked at, and this is why I call it the Doctor Who question, is because a Doctor Who episode always ends with the explanation. Whether we like it or not, or whether it's a good one or not, if the episode is good or not, um, it always ends with this like almost Victorian explanation of the sciences behind the fantastical, behind the ghosts that we see. And they lend themselves um, towards science, at, at least to the degree that you can in a Doctor Who episode. So I'm fascinated with that transition of what is real, what is possible. And, and especially in Latin American fiction, we have this sense of unstable reality. I'm a huge fan. And I know one of the things that got me really excited about um, speaking to Marcella is I know that she has a Borges quote on her website um, about divert, you know, his, his famous in the Garden of Forking Paths. Um, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to hand it over to Marcella because this is such an interesting question in thinking about how do we describe or how do we prove or disprove um, what we feel or seal, see, excuse me. That's a good Doctor Who question. <laughs> Yeah, so, so first I would like to say that when I say um, we are trying to uh, make it attractive to the public, so we say uh, we are trying to explain the reason of our existence, correct? So that's the way we phrase our um, questioning about uh, why there is matter or us and everything we see rather than nothing. Uh, but in reality, physics and the law of physics um, kind of uh, go up to uh, what we think is the big bang, the, the, the beginning of things we can explain. And the best and simplest way I tell this is we never, uh, I don't think we would never dare to say that we are trying to explain how the big bang came, how the big bang came to be. So what, what started, what was the, you know, the, the initial, uh, flame <laughs> for for all what came afterwards, and I think that's where um, physics and religion um, are in a in a forking path, correct? Because um, you know I'm very respectful of uh, other people' beliefs. Uh, I myself was educated as, as a, a Catholic because in Argentina uh, most people are Catholic and and those who are not Catholic are Jewish. So, and then there's a little bit of other religions, but much less, I would say. Um, so I, I, I was educated that way. I, um, I have educated my kids in being respectful for all you know, beliefs. I think that's the way we should be. But I don't think physics is, uh, has the power or the tools to answer any questions that are related to beliefs. And uh, uh, in fact, one of the things, some, some people are more drastic than others in this, vis in this way of, uh, in this vision of what the science and physics is, but the idea is, uh, you know, in physics, all what is physics is something that we think that we can uh, experimentally prove. Okay, so questions that are not questions that we can experimentally prove are more metaphysical questions. And then you move to another level where, you know, we can discuss forever. And that's why the multiverse or, or this eternal inflation, inflation is at the boundary, okay? Because it's most likely not something we're going to be able to prove. Mm -hmm. We may find, uh, you know, if we find really confirmation of cosmological inflation, as we think we will, because it fits with all what we have all the data we have, uh, then you could argue if there is one universe, one bubble, why shouldn't be others? Okay, but this is a meta, you know, more metaphysical or philosophical argument, correct? I can't really write an equation that says if there is one universe, there should be more in a uh, conclusive way. So I don't think we can say anything about, um, you know, gods or or other other, you know. Uh, other beliefs that people may have. And I adore, Marcella, that liminal space. You know, being first generation, being a writer, coming from two cultures. My mother's family is Lithuanian Jewish. My, my father's family is, is Catholic and Ecuadorian. So I always found myself in the liminal space. And writing about parallel universes 
I felt that wonderful discomfort of something that is not able to be proved, but in which there are scientists seriously working on it. And, you know, one of the, just to add a little bit, one of the things that I find so fascinating about that question is, you know, I, at a young age, I knew for whatever intents and purposes or reason that, that I was an atheist. And, and I think one of the constant questions you're asked as a writer or as anyone, if you're an atheist, is where is your awe? Where is your belief? Where is your, almost your morality? And one of the most beautiful things I think through studying evolutionary biology and, and now a little bit of physics is that I have a deeper awe of the universe, a deeper awe of asking questions and those unexplained things, the possibility that physicists one day could find mathematical equations, could find the reason behind them for me impacts a deeper beauty than I think for me at least otherwise could deeply respectful of, of religions I've come from too. <laughs> um, but I, 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 I love that work because I found early on that the awe, I'm even just reading about your work and, and the question of the Higgs and, and, and having it give weight, having it give literal weight to everything is, is a fundamentally profound thing for me to think about more so than I might if I thought about ghosts or even <laughs> a, a certain type of God. Um, so yeah. <laughs> And we have time for about two more questions I'm going to try and squeeze in. Uh, so, Michael, has writing this novel inspired you to explore physics or other types of scientists further? Yeah, absolutely. absolutely. Um, I, you know, I did, in my undergraduate, I did study literature, education, but also evolutionary biology. Um, I'm always, you know, I always love following science. Um, I read new scientists voraciously. I, half of my books um, that I've been purchasing over the past 10 years or science or memoirs about scientists. Um, it absolutely convinces me that I love the challenge of writing about different scientists and, and those different worlds. And the, the next project I am working on is, um, is set in the future in 2050 and does partly follow the life of an Ecuadorian ecologist in the Amazon. Um, I, it would, you know, I, for me to continue to write about physicists, I'd have to wait maybe a little, a little bit, but I definitely want to move into another, um, an, another field in the research. And it allows me the, the joy of suddenly buying an enormous amount of books about ants and the Amazon and entomologists. And so I'm kind of living in that research right now. So the short answer to that is absolutely. And then a question that I think can work for both of you, who or what are messengers between sectors? Who or what? Okay. Uh, so you, you want to go? I, I can start. Um, so um, from the physicist point perspective, messengers are in, in the physics, in the particle physics point of view, they are these particles, this paramanu that uh, I like so much, uh, the, the, the term uh, from, from uh, Michael's book. Um, for example, the, as I said, the Higgs could be uh, a, a messenger. Uh, messengers are um, particles that um, connect uh, or, or transmit forces, for example, okay, that are some type of messengers. Uh, and basically is anything uh, what we think as a physicist is maybe not so um, abstract, okay, we, we think, you know, we have uh, this dark sector where dark matter lives and many other things live and they talk among themselves, but not to us. And then there is one particle, the Higgs, another, you know, the Higgs is a very special type of particle that uh, its existence tells us there is a new type of interaction that we have never seen before. You know, we see the electromagnetic interaction, the gravitational interaction are the ones that we see every day. And then there are two that are there, but we don't see it so readily that are called the strong and weak forces. Uh, so the Higgs is uh, telling us that there is a new type of force. And so when we talk about messengers, we talk about uh, particles that will uh, pass information from one sector to the other. Uh, and in many cases, by using different forces that, that are just connecting the two sectors. So there are new forces new particles, or could be the particles we know that just happen to have a portal, an opening, you know, into that unknown world. 
And I would have to answer that, of course, as a writer saying our only reality that we have in which to communicate to each other is, is language. And it's malleable, it is messy, it is used for some of the worst political purposes and for mm -hmm. some of the deepest things that we appreciate and some of our deepest joys. But it is the only thing we have. And I, I again, I'm going to go back to Marcella's, Marcella's brilliant term, almost not talking to us. It's language is almost, not it's just, but it's all we have. It's all we have. Um, and so I really have to look at that from almost a linguistic point of view. Great. Thank you so much. Uh, I want to thank everyone for tuning in to today's program. Please remember to visit c2st.cnf.io to evaluate today's program for a chance to win an Amazon gift card. If you're interested in purchasing The Lost Book of Andana Moreau, you can see the bookshop link in the comment section below. I want to thank you. To, uh, thank you. Our Thank our speakers, Marcella and Michael, for taking the time to join us today. I'd also like to thank our partners at the Chicago Public Library, WindyCon, and the UIC Latino Cultural Center. If you enjoyed today's program, please consider donating to C2ST at c2st.org, where you can find more information about our programs and also read our timely STEM blogs. Thank you again for watching. <laughs>